Should you be doing your day job and then coming home and renovating? So you're looking at a new house and you're thinking like, I know I'm gonna renovate it and I'm gonna make the big bucks. What do I do? Where do I start? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? I'm Josh, a builder here in New Zealand. Today for Smoko Chat, I'm gonna to talk to you about renovating for profit. Cue the cheesy intro. Nick Moore, build more. Follow Nick as well. Nick asked the question, when buying a house, what should I look for that's worth the time to make a profit? Great question, Nick. Our first house was a classic 1950s weatherboard house. My wife and I spent about a thousand hours all up renovating and refreshing that before selling that so that we could take on the section nobody wanted. I wouldn't say by any stretch of the imagination I am a pro at renovating, although that was a large part of my apprenticeship as well. Let's break it down. First, I'll talk about like what we looked for. So we got this 1950s weatherboard house. Bing! It was in central upper heart. It felt like at the time we were looking for ages and we'd always go to these open homes and the person had just recently painted the house and they'd put a new flat pack kitchen and a new bathroom and then they were wanting megabucks for it. And that's not what I wanted. As a tradie who loved doing that type of work, I wanted to take on my own project. I wanted something that we could get stuck into and make our own. And so we were looking for a, you know, a classic doer-upper. First and foremost, you want it to have good bones, like a good solid structure. You don't want to have to be doing things like foundations, piles, you don't want to slump in the slab, you don't really want to have to do excessive amounts of work to the roof. I looked for something where there wasn't visible signs of rot, and if there are those things involved, it's not that you can't fix them, but the time that is going to take to fix them is going to be so much more involved. Usually, it's better to let someone else take those on. What sort of area? My father-in-law was in the Air Force and he got moved around a lot. And one of his pieces of advice to me was look for something that will be desirable to other people. And when you go to on-sell the house, you want to keep the market of people you're on selling it to as wide as possible. Stick to that kind of like middle ground of like three bedroom family home. So look for a good family area. Could you and would you raise kids in this area? Schools, supermarket, proximity to parks, that sort of thing. Bonus tip, one of the things we did when we renovated, and this got passed on again, some advice from my father-in-law that he passed on, go to the house, write down all your ideas when you first take over the house, but then live in it. We lived in our upper heart house for six months before we attacked any renovations. Because what you think's important on day one and what you think is important once you've lived in it for a bit changes. Your first impressions are really important because when you're going to on sell, that's the same first impressions that people buying off you will get. When you do those first couple of walkthroughs of the house, you really want to make sure that you write down, hey, this is what I noticed. This is what I thought wasn't great. This is what I'd like to change. But then I'd really encourage you to live in the house for a bit and get a feel for like even little things like when I go into the kitchen, I really wish the thing was there or I really wish there was a doorway here. In that thousand hour video here where I actually talk about that reno, I talk about how we didn't touch the exterior walls. We worked within the confinements of the four exterior walls and we rejigged the floor plan. But what I found is that in my case, pushing out and extending the house and touching the building envelope and the roof line was going to be another one of those huge amounts of cost for little gain and so wherever possible i would encourage people to work with what they've got before they consider extensions when we'd finally decided on our plan we see the timeline in place and we decided that we were going to move out of the house and we were gonna do all the work and we weren't gonna move back into the house until the work was complete. Now, complete is a bit of an arbitrary line, like 
there was still a few lingering jobs, but it meant that we weren't living in this continual building site for the next three years. And I think that's sometimes the tradey trap is we go to work all day and we work on other people's homes and we underestimate how much you can get done in a day when you're on someone else's building site and you're not emotionally attached to the job. And then you can come home and get bogged down in one tiny little thing because you're thinking about so many details. Before you know it, months have gone by and you haven't done any work at all or any real work. Breaking the project down into distinct stages live in the house, plan the reno, do the reno, move back into the house. If you do decide to go for the longer route and do the reno while you're living in the house, the one thing I'd encourage you to do is do one space at a time. Tackle that room, put all your energy into getting that room done and complete, and then move on to this room, and then move on to this room. Don't have part projects going on everywhere because that's when you settle for it and 10 years later you're still living in this part project building. So my advice for money rules deposits is talk to your mortgage broker. They are there to help you make that happen. And they're the ones who are up to date with lending rules. They'll know what you can get, what your income is. So my personal approach to buying our first home for renovating was that we set an upper limit on our budget and we, had, we were really clear on our budget before we went in. And then when we did the reno, we were really clear on our budget. And that's really important because you don't want to get carried away and start doing, you know, importing custom made tiles from Italy when a, a pack of subway tiles from Mitre 10 will do the same job. It sounds crude, but it literally is like a hundred decisions like that to hit that overall budget. That would be my one big piece of advice about money. And so no one's an expert on that stuff. My philosophy is like, I'll stick to building and doing what I do well, and I'll let the mortgage broker and the accountant and the lawyer and the banker do what they do well. So just to reiterate, in that department, find good people doing good work and work with them. Ask someone who's recently purchased a house, hey, what lawyer did you use? Were they good? Were they bad? Because as we know, the rules are constantly changing. Like literally just two days ago, they announced some new changes. And then so everyone's like, ah, oh, what does that mean? And like, I can't stand here and tell you exactly what that means because I'm not an expert. I've already been on the phone to the people I have a relationship with and asked them, hey, can you interpret this for me? Let's be honest, renovating a house is not for everyone. It can be the most rewarding and the most frustrating thing at the same time. I vividly remember a point where I was standing in the middle of my lounge and I could see through the kitchen wall that I demolished and I could see through the hallway wall I demolished all the way to my son's bedroom and I just was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? And sometimes that's a problem, like ripping into and starting a project's fun, but you get to this middle bit, the, you know, getting over the hump and it's really hard and it takes a long time and lots of unexpected things pop up. And so you need to be able to just take it one step at a time. You need to be the type of person that can look up a YouTube video or ring around your mates and ask for advice. Or if you're not that type of person, you need to be willing to get in the experts and the professionals and you need to be willing to pay them a fair rate for a fair job. And that can be really rewarding, but it's not for everyone you are not only taking on an extended amount of work, but you're also juggling with paperwork, quotes, councils, and there's an element of risk. It's on you and your shoulders to finish that project and see it through to realize that increase in value. Before you take on a large reno, you need to do a small project. You need to work out, is this the type of thing I want to do? And also bearing in mind, it's totally different doing it for yourself after hours, opposed to rocking up to someone else's building site where they've already made the decisions, they've already got the money, and you're just doing what you're told to do. And so as a trader, you need to think about that separation and you need to be clear about that. I guess I better do an outro. If you're still watching at this point, thanks so much. I really do appreciate it. If you haven't already, go ahead and click subscribe. Make sure you follow my Instagram stories or comment below for your chance to be on the next Smoko Chat question. And I'll see you on the next video. Good coffee.